Ladies and gentlemen, we've got your new streamer showdown champion. Who could it possibly be? You got it right. It's this guy right here. And might I say he's looking mighty fine. What is that skincare routine? Because mama. So I won the streamer showdown this past weekend. If you don't know what that is, it's the biggest football manager competition uh, in the world. It happens right here on Twitch. They even have this show called The Lowdown, which uh, has a lot of fun stuff happen on it. Crazy stuff happen on it like this. Uh, of course, I'm sorry. Of course, I'm off. What did you expect, <laughs> you morons? It's this huge, big event. You crown the champion at the end and your boy won it for the second time ever. I won the championship. I'm the best football manager player in the world right now and we're going to soak it up. But, but what I thought would be interesting is instead of just sitting here gloating because let's be honest i was pretty bad in fm21 relatively and so i haven't had the opportunity to gloat in a while we had to work really hard to get the win this time so i probably should you know pat yourself on the back self-care something like that instead of doing that go through and talk about the changes that i made so that when you are playing football manager you can manage your matches the same way so the way that the streamer showdown works is there's a league on saturday the league table looked like this we were pretty good, but we're not going to talk about any of that because that would take too long. What we're going to talk about are the quarterfinals, semifinal, and final that were played on Sunday. Two legs apiece, which allows an, a lot of opportunity, not only for drama, but for adjustments between one leg, two legs. We also had multiple red cards. We allowed multiple penalties. We had a bunch of suspensions, and we still won, obviously. Yeah! So how did we do it? And how did we overcome the fact that we gave up like 4XG in the first game? <laughs> so since there were three ties, we're going to break this into three segments. First is our quarterfinal with Work the Space. This is how to deal with width. Second is how to deal with the absence of width, otherwise known as narrow. And then there's a little adversity segment under it's like 2B where we had to deal with some crazy adversity. And then three, three in the final is how to react to your opponent but we're gonna pick it up with one so work the space i beat him in the league stage but he had a lot of xg and had a very good team so i didn't know if he was gonna stick with what he had or change to a wider system because what he was playing was essentially a four three 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 strikers two midfielders in front of one and the back four he came out in a four three three yes but he instead of having three strikers brought them wide and so now all of a sudden we've got two wingers to mess with. So first, a quick overview of the tactics I had been using. We've been going with a 4-3-1-2, where we have three midfielders with a sagging deep-lying playmaker in the middle, attacking midfielder, two advanced forwards, a back four with very aggressive fullbacks, not wingbacks, fullbacks on the side. The other tactic we use is we pop that deep-lying playmaker down to defensive position, have a flat middle three with an attacking midfielder out of the middle. He went with width. We decided to use our 4 3 one, two, so that's this, except the wide players turn into Carraleros. And so they're laterally covering the space like I actually talked about in this video, which if you want to check out me talking about Carraleros all the time, absolutely do that. It's grade A nerd stuff. My plan for the first match, even though we were on the road, which in Football Manager always makes things more challenging, did not work. We created the number of chances that we anticipated with our formation. We control the game, get the ball out wide to the two fullbacks. They either look to make a play themselves to one of the forwards cutting behind, which is what happens on the first goal to Patrick Sheik, or they work the ball back into the middle, find one of the side midfielders with a lot of space, and they're able to attack and make a play from that position. In this case, we just kind of scored a free kick. But we gave up far too many shots. We anticipated giving up bad crosses. When you look at the analysis section of the shots, you see a lot of the shots are close to the goal, but they're not actually high XG shots. This means they are contested headers, which is something that we can live with. He did not have a lot of highlights in the game playing on key highlights. He just had a lot of shots. So how do we address that going into the second match? We're going to be at home and it's 2-2. Away goals don't count. So for the second game, here's what we did. We went into the opposition instruction and decided to close down both of the fullbacks because if these are bad deep crosses. We need to make sure that our wide midfielders are getting after those fullbacks quicker so that they are unable to get those bad deep crosses into the box. This also does the job of dragging those midfielders wide in defense, which is what we want. We want them wide in defense, drags them wide in defense naturally because they're following the fullbacks. And so they'll be able to help out more with the wingers as well. I also switched formation. Another issue I could have in the 4 3 2 1 or 3 1 2 numbers is that i when they get behind that attacking midfielder only have three guys and if my midfielders go wide there's only one so that means one of those carreleros is going to get occupied 
by one of his midfielders on the front line, one of those two guys, whether it's Kondogbia or Gio Reyna. So I decided to switch to the 4-1-3-2, which gives me an extra midfielder positionally responsible for defense in the middle of the park, which means we can go two on two with his front line when we are defending in that spot. And because we have that extra person farther back to help defend, that's going to allow those Carleros to get wide more over the course of the second leg. The last player instruction we wanted to put on was a tight mark of Jeffrey Kondogbia because we realized after the first game that he was the center midfielder that's making the run. And in a Football Manager 22, you always have to identify which central midfielder is going to be making that run and have the opportunity to run all the way past your back line. For us, that was Kondogbia. And that ended up being true because Jeffrey Kondogbia scored this beautiful goal early in the second half to put Jack up in a match that we had honestly been edging up to that point, as you can see by the stats that have been accumulated so far. So our changes had worked. We were much more responsible defensively and Kondogbia's great goal removed. We were still balling, but we needed goals. I've got 30 minutes left, so what do we do? We want to preserve the integrity of what we're trying to do, nullify his fullbacks, essentially leave our fullbacks one-on-one -on -one with their wingers, and, well, essentially cancel out the middle of the field and be able to dominate the middle of the field. So we flip up to attacking. We flip up to attacking, and we return to the 4-3-1-2, because momentum and the mentality of your players in a game is so tremendously important. And I know since we've been on the front foot for most of this game, that switching to this formation is not going to have a calamitous effect like it had in the first leg. We're not going to start giving up 30 shots or what is on pace for 30 shots. We preserve what we have. We leave Danny Olmo on support after putting him forward. And we switch the Carleros to Metzalas, who stay wider, but they get further up the field. That's okay, because they can still be responsible for the fullbacks. They just won't help with the wingers as much. And it gives them a lot more freedom to get forward. Instead of trying to switch into different spots in the midfield, Metzalas can go all the way to the end line with impunity. And here's the way this ends up playing. We absolutely tie up his entire midfield. And once we get the fullbacks, behind the wingers, we actually are going to have them outnumbered. And with Metzalas, we have more potential for more dynamic runs. Obviously, this could leave us more exposed in a turnover, but that's the sort of ratcheting up and risk taking that you need to do. The key to this sort of change is we still needed to address his width. We couldn't leave ourselves completely exposed. And I very rarely, unless you're in like the last five minutes of a game that there is no tomorrow in, advocate leaving yourself completely exposed going forward. So we stayed responsible and watched the width. We just allowed for more dynamic attacking play. And we pick it up from this spot in the match. We've got Jude Bellingham is the deep lying midfielder. Danny Elmo is dropped into the middle. Now, the rush up the left side here is not something we necessarily would have gotten out of a Carlero. We've got our forwards. We've got this nice five man pressure with Nkunku as well on the right side that can get forward when Danny Elmo is dropping in. And we'll see where Elmo goes with this. He goes to Castrovilli. Castrovilli finds, of all people, Manuel Lazari who is free, the whole defense is occupied with all the other pressure, and Manuel Lazari is actually able to slot the ball home. I make a change. This is a totally a mentality change. I noticed that Nkunku is nervous, so we want to get him off. We bring in Bruno Guimaraes. We move Bellingham out wide because Guimaraes is a better passer, and Bellingham is a better playmaker, more athletic, more capable going forward. We start to really create chances. We get Breel and Bolo in behind. This is why I love having two strikers, because you can go one-on-one -on -one with center backs on aerial balls especially when they're physical specimens like Zapata, Sheik, Mbolo, and Zola, the four forwards that we had in this tournament, they have at any point the opportunity to just out-physical somebody and win the ball like Briel and Bolo just did. The second goal we score is such an unbelievable tenet of all the things we were trying to do in our base tactic, and it was able to work. We were able to overwhelm the center part of the pitch when it absolutely mattered to score that winning goal. First, a ball back to Schwolo, and I actually like to play out short when I have a deep-lying playmaker, is the ball eventually finds them, especially when you're only pressing with one player, which is what he's doing. Guimaraes plays it into a channel, so I always like to have forwards whose best foot is on the outside when I'm playing with a front two, because the ball into the channel is really prevalent. It's a great way to advance play. So Guimaraes picks it out. Zapata, who actually has got a pretty good left foot, but he's right-footed. Zapata was better than Patrick Sheik in this tournament. I was just letting you know. Once he has that ball, the layback to the fullback will distract one of the midfielders because we are officially behind the winger. And once that happens, we've won, tactically. We just need the players to finish it off. Because once one player commits to Bernat, that midfielder can dog be as out of position. Look where Gio Reyna is. He's responsible for Danny Olmo. And this means we've got Nkunku, we've got Mbolo, and we've got Manuel Lazari on that far side of the field 
that are going to be working three against three against a flat-footed defense. And Castrovilli is able to pick it out. It's Bellingham. Sorry, forgot about the substitution. It was Jude Bellingham. So now you've got your three against three. Bellingham actually is able to draw the center back, which center back in an impossible position here because those two left-sided players are responsible for the outside. The center back's going two against one. Outside, Little Azari. Inside to Mbolo. And obviously, it's a nice-looking finish. That, that That's what we're trying to create. In those odd number situations where you've got somebody in front of a back line and that back line doesn't have the ability to cover all of those players and you're getting running starts, you get a lot of 1v1s. And that's what we created and that's what got us the winning goal. In the semifinal, we're going up against the Mad Hatter Tom FM and El Partido Controversial, a derby, a rivalry. We're really good friends, but every time we play, it always seems to be insane, and this was absolutely no different. The reason is we play very similar tactics. He came out in a 4-1-3-2, and I came out in a 4-3-1-2. He is basically playing the tactic that I use when I'm not using this one. <laughs> so then why did I go with a 4-3-1-2 on the road? Very simple. This hits on one of my main tenets for FM22. When a team is sitting deep that is offering you more of an opportunity to attack, a 4-1-3-2 is a more deep formation. So I wanted to meet that further up the field. You look at the Bielsa-style man-to-man matchups here. I'm matching his three with my midfield three, his defensive midfielder with my attacking midfielder, and we are playing in his half of the field. Now, this is one of the biggest lessons I feel like I learned going through this Football Manager Championship is the first goal we give up, the second goal we give up in this game. Both are largely out of our tactical control. This is why the mentality and just the recruiting and ability of your players is so important. We give up a free kick goal, Benzema breaking free of the man marking. There's just not a lot you can do defensively when it comes to free kick defense. And Karim Benzema puts together a nice finish. He then is going to win a penalty. He actually gets a penalty in both legs in this tie, which is great. I loved that. I loved that. Fullbacks need to be great in crossing in this, so we pull one back. Nice cross from Juan Bernat to Patrick Sheik. When you look at the underlying stats at this point in the game, there's a reason that despite giving up those two goals, I was actually pretty optimistic about the outcome. One of the most important skills you can have playing football manager is assessing whether you actually deserved to win a game or not. Playing football manager is like playing poker. You can do everything right, and they can still hit an ace on the river. You need to know whether you are doing everything you can to win. And we had more shots, more chances, better chances from the run of play, and that's what I'm looking at. Those underlying metrics of clear-cut chances, half chances, XG, shots, possession, pass completion, whatever you feel like is important for you to be executing. If you're executing those things, and you know you have the talent to be executing those things, if you happen to give up a penalty and they score, especially if the penalty isn't just a player with great dribbling being isolated against somebody that's bad at defending, which is obviously something you can address, then you know you should trust it. Don't over-tweak. Don't react too early. Don't get angry about it. Get even. I literally doing what you were doing before and shouting in courage. We test my theory again. We concede a third goal. Bad turnover, breaking the press. Now, this is something that, while unfortunate, not something that's going to happen all the time, you should pay attention to why. Jude Bellingham doesn't have fantastic first touch. He coughs the ball up trying to break. And so for the rest of the tournament, I actually don't use him as the deep-lying player anymore, just because that note is in the back of my mind. We score a second goal from the run of play, which is obviously encouraging that we can do this and that I should be sticking to what we're doing going forward. Our third goal, also from the run of play, forcing his defense to make difficult decisions. If we get sustained possession, we're able to get those intense runs that then occupy his second center back, open up a channel for Briel and Bolo. And when you get that kind of opportunity to cross, you better be able to finish it off. And once again, the fourth goal, we occupy the middle of the defense and we break through. Our fifth goal is a free kick, which nice. The last tactical move we make, he's going to end up scoring one more goal in this game, is I notice that Dominic Sobas lie out of the middle is making more aggressive runs, and so I decide to go with a one, you know, a midfield diamond, essentially, of a four. I drop that midfielder and make that starting position lower so that it's easier for him to actually defend that spot. And then naturally, the fourth goal we give up is also a set piece. So in my mind, I'm thinking tactically, we've given up about a half goal because we had a mistake playing the ball out from the back. Bellingham got caught in a spot he couldn't handle. It goes down to the theme of the semifinal, which is how to play against a narrow system. We gave up four set piece goals, but only one was a corner, right? One is a penalty very far away from a play. One is a goal from a free kick. None of them were us being tactically 
completely broken down through the middle the way we were able to do in a countering way because we were further up the field. So I'm very optimistic going into the second leg. Things wouldn't stay that way. Tom comes out in a more aggressive formation. He has opted for the 4-3-1-2, which of course we used as well. Very early on, we concede a penalty, which is a threat to the mentality of the team and obviously has a chance to put a lot more pressure on my players. Then the second goal we concede no less than 20 minutes later, and it's a scramble play after a free kick where my guys don't find the right position. So I am internally molding because we just keep getting beat in these situations, but I know based off the metrics that I see again, those stats over on the side that we are doing well enough to be able to turn this game around and win it. So I'm not going to change anything. At halftime, I go for a change I honestly probably should have gone for earlier once I realized that he was going to be deeper on the wings. I bring the fullbacks up and drop the midfield into a diamond. So since I'm not getting wing pressure, I might as well have my fullback start at a higher position to attack. I switch the midfield into a diamond so that we do have a more defensively responsible person in the middle because he still is going to be able to get good numbers forward. They're just going to be in more central areas. And so we need Pasalic to be there. This change leads to some shots and we still have control of the game as it goes through the second half. But as things happen in Football Manager, we're befallen by misfortune. Eder Militao gets sent off. When Militao gets sent off, I'm faced with some tough decisions. I replace the defensive midfielder with a center back and that's it. After a few minutes and some substitutions, I end up with a midfield three. This is what feels like it's going to be right to me. I want two Matt Salas, center mid on attack. It's defensively responsible enough. We've got three people positionally in the midfield, left fullback on attack because that's the guy we had to sub in. He could not play farther forward. And I figured it would help a little bit with our defense and the wing back on attack on the right in Lazari. I am wedded to the two forwards. I do not want to take them off because they are what opens up a defense, whether it's getting into the channel or going one-on-one -on -one against center backs as an opportunity to continuously apply pressure against them and maybe get a break. I modify this formation by moving Danny Olmo forward as we get more desperate, but defensively, we're hanging on. We give up two highlights, if I remember, between then and when we actually get a goal from my throw-in play, which is nice. You know, it's nice when one of your set-piece plays comes into play, a nice short throw-in to the guy hugging the baseline. They're out of position defensively. You get somebody in front of the back line and can tap the ball into the back of the net. The second goal is exactly what I'm talking about and why I stayed married to the two forwards because we win the ball quickly. Tom has switched to go forward again. He helped us out by becoming more defensive, which allowed us to be more attacking, weirdly enough, when we were at 10 men. And you play the ball up to Duvon Zapata. Well, guess what? He's one-on-one -on -one with a center back. If he beats that center back, all of a sudden, he's in on goal, scores a goal a minute later, and we win. A man down. If you are one man down in FM22, you really can still keep things going. The only decision you have to make is do you want to continue to have the exact same defense or the exact same offense? I chose the exact same offense for obvious reasons. So the final, a lesson in how to react to your opponents. I get a look at his formation when you go to the opposition instructions. That's what your opponent is lining up in for the day. You can see it. He's lining up in a 5-2-1-2. So the midfield is actually going to be pretty open. But if I play my normal formation of 4-3-1-2, I'm leaving that back part open. So how can I continue to exploit the space behind his midfield while being responsible for the space underneath my midfield and being able to cover his fullbacks in the meantime? Well, we go with a diamond. But this is a key here. Like, this is not a formation we played the whole tournament, but it's not so different from what we played before that we're going to have bad familiarity or players playing out of position. We've adapted without ruining ourselves. The defensive midfielder here is going to be able to stay responsible for his attacking triumvirate, as you see up the top, while the attacking midfielder is still going to be behind the midfield two that he has. The only threats for width are his wingbacks. I've got fullbacks there, so we're matched up man-to-man -man with help from the midfielders on the outside. We're good. In order to make sure my attacking midfielder would be able to get into those spots more often, we raised our line of engagement to very high and made no other changes the way we approached the game. Our first goal was a corner, which is gravy. You always set up your set pieces the best way that you can. Near post, biggest guy, there he goes, nods at home. Our second goal was, again, evidence of our tactic and overrunning the midfield, which is what we were trying to do. The two strikers in the attacking midfielder distract all the center backs. We see our right striker has occupied the center back. This leaves the left back in a two for one situation as Juan Bernat gets enough space to play a ball. The left back doesn't commit as hard as he should to the right central midfielder, Christopher Nkunku, and Kunku gets into a pocket of space and actually creates a complete 1v1 opportunity. At this point, I was feeling pretty good. But naturally, we get Bruno Guimaraes, our defensive midfielder, sent off again. 
This is dangerous because he has a very free-flowing, attack-heavy system, obviously. So I need to drop Danny Elmo. I create a midfield three because I want to keep pressure on that pocket of space behind. I want to continue to overload the midfield. Center mid on attack, two Carraleros. Carraleros are creating that defensive responsibility, covering the fullbacks, also responsible for everything else, and they can help track runs through the middle. Center mid on attack allows us to continue to threaten. Hindsight, I probably should have put Danny Elmo as a deep line playmaker on defend because we ended up giving up a goal because they were able to overwhelm the box. We didn't get enough people back. 2-1 to the second leg. We give up some chances. We need to figure out how to defend their right back. We end up putting a tight mark on their right back because he got in behind one time and you never want to let that sort of thing happen again. But we create our goal in the exact same way. We both came out looking tactically the same. I wanted to approach the game the same way, even though we were on the road, we were the better team in the first leg. And Cuckoo finds a pocket of space. And instead of being the guy that runs in behind, he actually picks out a striker making a run, taps to the other striker, and we have a goal. Second goal, we create a two-for-one situation against the wing back again off a throw-in, and that allows us to play a free ball into the box, which when you have players as good as we did, you create another goal. And from there, it was just gravy. Sweet left foot's absolutely in the game, but we're on the road. We've got even goal difference. We've had the most obvious goal scoring chances in the game outside of Striger Larson's 1v1, so I'm happy. But then I see sweet left foot knowing he needs a bunch of goals switch to a three striker system. I figured out earlier in this tournament the way to shut that down. And do not be afraid if they make a big institutional change to also make a big institutional change. We roll out there with a formation that absolutely shuts down everything the three striker formation is trying to do. A 3-3-2-2. Three, three, two, two. We get our wing backs further up so we can carry an offensive threat. We have two very fluid center midfielders in front of a deep lying playmaker. A deep lying playmaker has to be Jude Bellingham, unfortunately, because Guy Moraes is off, even though I said I didn't want to use Bellingham there again. We scored a goal and he scored a goal in the second half out of this formation. The sweet left foot is a is a brilliant, brilliant manager. Won the league as you saw at the beginning of this. But we ended up in a really good situation where we drafted a team to play this variety of narrow systems, and he just didn't have the midfielders in the right spot to be able to deal with it. And once we moved to one side, he didn't have that. Everybody talks about fluidity. He didn't have that whole, he didn't have that discipline positionally. Once everything flowed to one side and got to the other and Kunku's in space, and that's how we get a couple of absolutely massive goals is going two on one on the opposite side of the field. They were tight matches throughout. I am over the moon that we were able to win. And this is just the tactical side of it. There was the whole man management side of it and training side of it. And uh, I'll be perfectly honest, the recording for this video is an hour and 54 minutes. It, obviously, the video you're watching now is a lot shorter than that. But that's how many minute tactical things are going through your head when you're playing. And if they're not, that's okay. Hopefully this video gives you some extra things to think about how to adapt to your opponent, beat a narrow system, uh, and beat a wide system. If you want a simple note to take away, think about who's picking up who and how you can get them out of position to win a game. You got to score, right? So let's try and win the next one. There's another streamer showdown next month. We're invited already because we freaking won. Hope to see you there. See you on stream or something. Right.